All right. This has been wild. Around a month ago, I uploaded this video to my channel. It was a Fiverr commission, one that I really liked, I was very proud of, and one that represented some sort of growth in my craft. So I thought, you know what? Let's upload it to my YouTube channel. So I asked for permission. I made a funny title and a thumbnail, and I just put it on there. And that's it, right? That's that's it. It's just a meme, right? So this sole video has gathered the most amount of views, likes, comments, and overall interactions in my whole channel's history. Like all of my videos combined together, summed into one, don't even make half of the amount of the interactions this video has. So I figured I couldn't just disappear into oblivion and just not talk about this. So here we are. This is how I made the Minecraft soundtrack into Midwest emo something. That's probably not the title. I haven't come up with that yet. Okay, for everyone's sake, I will be dividing this video in parts. That way it's easier to navigate. So you can go to the description or just hover over the play bar and select the chapter that interests you the most. Although I suggest you stay throughout the whole thing because it's gonna be a fun journey. All right, so as I previously stated, this was a Fiverr commission. So I was pitched by Alex Tanuki through there and they had this idea. They said, hey, quick question. Do you do Midwest emo? To which I replied, yeah, I've done my fair share of Midwest emo in the past. And so they came back at me and said, all right, so do you know the Minecraft soundtrack? And so I said, yeah. And the rest is pretty much history. Here we are. I actually want to take a minute to thank Alex personally. Like I have thanked them already, but I've not done it in like this fashion, like showing my face and actually talking. <laughs> so I really want to thank them because if it wasn't for them, this video will have never have existed because the whole idea of the Minecraft soundtrack made into Midwest emo was theirs and the set list and all that just, just they came up with that so that's not me that's on Alex and it is thanks to them that this video exists and also they have single-handedly just kick-started my career because I have never gotten this amount of traffic on my channel or on every other media profile so Alex thank you so so much for the chance and I really hope we can keep working on the future. Thank you. So Alex had the set list already decided. So they sent me that selection of songs. And the first thing I thought was, where the frick is Sweden? Now, nah, like for real, have you played Minecraft myself? Sweden is probably, if not the first song that comes to mind, it's like top three songs that comes to mind when I think about Minecraft soundtrack. But then I didn't really have any complaints because the set list had this very particular order and I thought everything was so well thought beforehand that I just thought, okay, that was probably just a conscious decision to have Sweden off the list. So I just thought it was something that was premeditated and I just went with the vibe. So when I first heard the idea of creating the soundtrack into Midwest Emo, I kind of had a hard time thinking how I was going to manage to do that. But then I think, all right, Midwest emo is just post rock with like whiny vocals on top. So let's just keep it instrumental. Maybe if we slow it down and we take the drums off, we get like sort of ambient music, maybe. Well, ambient music is essentially Minecraft music and vice versa. So if we were to do the inverted process, so we'll just sped it up and add drums to it. Well, we have Minecraft post rock slash Midwest emo, right? So that was my thought process. Pretty much. I spent like a week listening to like the Minecraft soundtrack and American football, like nonstop. Yeah. So I got like, I got it ingrained on my brain. I still do. I can't, I can't do anything else now. My life has become Minecraft and Midwest emo. Thank you, Alex. 
to organize myself since this was the biggest project I've ever ventured on, at least one that had a deadline, I made a calendar because I had a month to do this whole thing. So I organized myself kind of like this. From January 25th all the way until February 14th, I will be producing the tracks. So I will have been almost three weeks to produce the whole thing, leaving me with a week for mixing and mastering. So this sounded phenomenal, but life doesn't always accommodate to a calendar. So things went off rails pretty fast. My computer broke down. I had to move places in between and I wasn't really doing that well economically. So I was struggling a lot. So dad left me with like only two weeks to work on the entire project. So I had to rearrange some of the schedule, some of the schedule, schedule, scheduling. I hate this language so much. I just hate it. I hate it. Why am I speaking this language? They said, I'm going to speak in Spanish. I'm going to speak in Spanish and I'm going to I don't, yeah, I don't respect this language enough. <laughs> so I was left with only the last two days. Like the, it was actually Saturday and Sunday. It was really funny. Those two days were destined to mix and master. So I had to pack everything into those days and just mix and master 10 songs in those two days. It was intense. I didn't sleep much but here we are we managed so let's talk let's talk production minecraft music is how i like to call it hauntingly melancholic there is something about the way that c418 like composes and arranges and the selection of timbres that he does that just make the whole soundtrack sound so intriguing and beautiful in a way that i've pretty much never heard elsewhere i knew from the get-go that what I was going to do wouldn't sound like the original soundtrack at all. I wanted to make something that was its own thing, something that paid homage to the original soundtrack, but without it being too obvious. The production process was actually pretty straightforward. I would just listen to the song, sit on with my guitar, try to figure out the key and the core elements of the song, like the melodies, the chord progressions, lead, lead motifs, lead motifs, and all those kind of musical thingies. And I would just lay down a simple drum beat and try to come up with a cool part on the guitar. Right, I'm gonna make a quick incision here, talking about guitar related stuff, like guitar tunings, guitar tone, guitar amplifiers, and all of those things. If you're not interested in that, you can just skip it and just come here to this timestamp that's gonna be on, on screen right now. You can, you can go there. The guitar I used for this entire project was this Chinese Strat copy I got like five years ago when I started playing guitar. It is the only electric guitar I own and the one that I've used on all of my projects so far. It sounds pretty decent, I might say. Midwest Emo is no stranger to alternative tunings, so for the whole thing I used a total of like three or four different guitar tunings, mainly this one. which gives you an open D major at nine chord. Pretty nice. And I also use this other one that is pretty cool too. This one gives you an open E major nine chord. This is essentially the tuning used on American footballs, never meant, but a semitone lower, which gives me a segue to talk about our best fighter on this blocky Midwestern journey, the capo. The capo is your best friend. This genre makes use of the capo heavily, and so did I, and so should you. You can transpose so easily with it, you can play in keys that were never thought to be played on a guitar, like A flat major or something, so make use of it. For guitar tones, I used a Fender Princeton type amp because of its warm, low sound, ideal for plucky twangly riffs. I added some twin rivers to have a richer overall sonority when I have multiple guitar parts playing at the same time. For distortion parts I used an OCD. For pickups it was mainly the middle and the neck sometimes combined. I think it's important to state that all of this was recorded directly into my audio interface, which is this Arturia Minifuse 2, 
and all the guitar and bass tones were emulated using iKey Multimedia's Amplitude. All right, let's talk music theory. Yeah, I know, I know, boo-hoo, music theory, boring, I hate you. But bear with me, this is going to be very simple stuff, and I'm not going to be actually teaching you music theory. If you are, however, interested in learning music theory, learning the basics, or in just expanding your knowledge, I recommend channels like Adam Neely's, Jake Alisa's, like Signal Music Studios, I think that's his channel. And if you speak Spanish, Jaime Altozano, he's got you covered. Te amo, Jaime. Besito. C418 has an immaculate ear for composition. He makes use of the major scale. I know, I know it's the most used scale in history, but the way he approaches composition using the major scale is very interesting. He doesn't go for cheerful and happy sounds, which is something you would expect out of the major, major scale. He actually makes use of very interesting intervals like the major seventh. He really likes the major seventh specifically, like in here. The major seventh gives a sort of uneasiness to what otherwise would be a very cheerful and stable chord, like take for example this F major chord. Now let's add the major seventh. That is bittersweet. Now let's add another note on top, the ninth. Oh yes, angst. The major ninth chord is heavily used on Midwest Emo, so having a tuning that is literally an open major ninth chord helps a lot. The chord progressions that he chooses sometimes are very simple, like a one to four, but the melody choices he makes, like going again up to that major seventh, is very interesting. So actually, that is something that resonates with Midwest Emo too, the use of major sevenths and major ninths. That is actually the sound of Midwest Emo. Alright, so knowing this and making use of the open guitar string tunings I've talked about in a guitar section that you should have not skipped, the process in coming up with the guitar parts was pretty straightforward. I would just figure out the key and put the capo on a fret that allowed me to play the one chord or the four chord as a major nine chord. And that's pretty much it. I would just doodle around until I figure something out. I will play around with polymeters like groupings of five notes, seven notes. That's pretty much how I came up with every guitar part on this thing. I will also, of course, listen to the main melody or counter melodies and try to come up with variations or things that quoted that on the, on, on the guitar parts. When I was orchestrating this, I knew that the whole spectrum would be flooded with doodly guitars. So I wanted to have a bass sound that was very scooped, very deep, and that played very long, sustained notes. That way it would interfere with the guitar parts. And the same thing with selecting the drum sound. I wanted something that was very tight and very fast and it had lots of decay. So I settled for this preset on Addictive Drums 2 and I think it sounds pretty killer on its own. And of course, as you've probably also heard, there were some questionable saxophone lines throughout the whole thing, as well as some organs here and there. Well, those were mainly Arturia, Analog Lab 5, I think it is, and some contact libraries that I got for the saxes. Yeah, that's as best as I could get. And I decided to just keep it very limited. I didn't want to add layers upon layers of instruments to the orchestration because I wanted the guitars to be the main focus and I didn't want my mix to be incredibly crowded and have a headache then when I have to mix it. So I just kept everything very simple so besides the guitar counterpoints and all of that i added like a little bit small instruments like a glockenspiel here and there just to add a little bit of detail to layers but that's pretty much it not much more than that one thing i did that i think was pretty funny that many people noticed was quote american football on many of the songs like the sax line from the summer ends i sung that on the first track or literally just quoting the riff to honestly on dry hands. Who's 
as well as the 7.4 ref on uh, Stay Home on Hackstrom and a variation of it on Door. I think that this actually made the whole thing come together even more and make it more of a proper homage instead of just a meme. So my camera just died, so let's continue like this. So this is going to get a little bit technical now since we're going to be talking about mixing and mastering. So if you're not interested in that, I suggest you skip to here, this timestamp. As I stated at the start of this video, I was initially planning on spending a whole week mixing and mastering the 10 tracks, but ended up having only two days to do so. So I had to do some planning before starting so I could make sure everything would go as smooth and fast as possible and that I wouldn't be spending more time than needed on things like organizing projects and stuff like that. For that, I made some pre-mix presets, like creating a bus for the drums with all the effects that I will be using and creating effects chains for things like vocals and bass to have them all be consistent throughout the whole project. And that's pretty much it. I started by exporting all of my tracks from my production sessions as separated stems, then loaded them into a new session exclusively for mixing, regulated the gain of every element to have them peak at around minus 9 dV and organized every instrument on its own category. I set the same BPM, the mixing sessions, as the production sessions for reasons that we'll get to discuss real soon, like in a little bit. And my mixing process is pretty straightforward. Start by getting a good balance only using volume and panning. And once it all sounds like it belongs in its own place, we can start mangling things up with effects and stuff. The first thing I like to do after this stage is create a river bus to which I will be sending every instrument separately. For this project in particular, I didn't want to have much reverb, so I used Valhalla's Room River, and here is where setting the right BPM is of enormous help. I used this BPM to river time calculator to have the exact amount of pre-delay and decay values for my tempo. This is of big help if you want to have a clean sounding river and most importantly, a musical sounding one. After this, I tackle every instrument individually. I aimed for a clean sound. I wanted everything to be pristine. I did plenty of subtractive EQ, some static, some dynamic. For the drums, I processed all the parts individually, as well as some bus processing for which I used an API 2500 type compressor, some SSL type EQ, and a tape machine to round up the transients a little bit and give the whole thing some warmth. I did something really funny with the drums, something that is becoming a common practice to me. I routed the kick and the snare, and sometimes the toms even, to a track and then overprocess it. I used some gate to accentuate the transients only, then added some extreme compression, some clipping and limiting as well, some saturation. Just, it gives the whole thing a lot more punch without sacrificing the dynamics of the overheads and room tracks. Like you blend this sand track to the original and you get this really punchy sound, it's really cool. The bass was very compressed too. For most tracks that had long bass notes all throughout, I used compressors with slow attack times like the LA-2A as well as Fairchild 660. And in others that had a very fast picked bass lines. I used the 1176 compressor first to accentuate the attacks actually. And I used the other two I previously mentioned. I did some side chaining on the low end of the bass to be triggered by the kick drum to clean up some of that very soft bass space to have room for the kick drum. Now for the main dish, guitars. The guitars were processed not so differently between each other. Most guitar parts were clean riffs that made a lot of emphasis on this string attack. Because of this, I used an 1176 type compressor with a slow attack time and a fast release to let the transients poke through and accentuate the note attack. The fast release actually allowed for the sound to not be overly compressed, since the compressor would release before the next note was played. Usually, after this compression, I would use some sort of optical compressor like the LA-2A, sometimes the Fairchild to even out even more the dynamics and just glue everything together. I want to give you guys a tip about compression that you actually may find useful on every aspect of mixing, not only guitars. When compressing heavily, use multiple compressors, compressing small bits, instead of using only one, compressing loads of dV. You will most likely always get an overall cleaner, tighter, overall more professional sound if you use multiple compressors to heavily compress instead of using only one working really hard. 
For example, let's say I'm looking to really compress a vocal track. I'm aiming at around minus 9 dB of compression. Real heavy stuff. So I load up an 1176, set the attack to fast so it catches the loudest peaks, and then push the threshold down until I get like minus 9 dB of gain reduction. What you will find is that the sound gets completely dull and you can actually hear the compression. This is something we usually don't want. Now, instead, Let's apply the same amount of compression, but spread it into three different compressors. Starting off the same way with an 1176 compressor, fast attack, slowish release, averaging at minus 3 dB gain reduction. Great, we're getting some compression going. Now let's add a third shell compressor after that, same thing, aim for minus 3 dB. And lastly, let's add an LA2A compressor, and we'll aim again for around minus 3 dB. The final result will still be a minus 9 dB compression but the second method will sound way cleaner and overall transparent. Here's a Navy comparison. Screaming through the street Screaming, screaming through the street now back to guitars. Don't be afraid to use buzz processing when mixing guitars, some glue compression is always welcomed. In this case, I used mainly the LA2A compressor at around minus 3 dB to glue some of the guitars. In some tracks, I had some acoustic guitars. It was this nylon string classical guitar I have here. On those tracks, I processed it in a way that it will be more of a background element rather than a main thing. Some sort of extra layer to add on top of the electric guitars. Something that added some sheen on top. For distorted guitars, I spend most time getting the sound to not be irritating to the ears. Distortion can get very annoying, especially when we get up to the mid highs. I made use of heavy subtractive EQ, low passing them at around 6k and cutting some annoying frequencies up in the 4 to 5k range. I also made use of one of my favorite plugins at the moment, Sooth 2 by OX Sound. This plugin is magical, don't know what it does, don't care, just throw it in there tweak some knobs and everything becomes harmonious and beautiful. Even though the story guitars are naturally heavy compressed, I still like using some boss compression on them. The API 2500 sounds very aggressive and it adds lots of extra bite to them. I also like doing some tape saturation on the boss to round it up a bit more and give it some extra warmth. Alright, now that I've talked about all the plugin shenanigans and the more specific stuff, I want to talk about the underdog of modern mixing. A step that so many people seem to overlook or straight up skip, and that is automation. Automation is probably the most important tool to have a mix stick out, have extra dynamic motion and overall be more interesting for the listener. These mixes are heavily automated from volume to panning automations all the way up to bypassing plugins and opening or closing up EQ curves. They don't have to be super obvious. Just taking some DB off of one track here and adding some of this out there and there for some parts of the songs, it can make a huge difference in the overall listening experience. People spend so much time producing and editing very, very minor details on the tracks when they're producing. So please spend your time on automation when mixing too. These things can make or break your mix. I'm not exaggerating. All right, it's a disclaimer. Please remember that a good mix starts with a good arrangement. If your bass part clashes with your guitar from the get-go, trying to fix them when mixing is gonna be very tedious and it just won't sound very good. So if you're mixing your own productions, take time to arrange everything in a way that makes sense. Write parts thinking about the bigger picture, think about the spaces you have to fill and the ones that have been already filled. The mastering process on this was pretty standard. I am not a mastering engineer, so I don't have any fancy analog equipment or anything. I just threw everything in the box. I created a big session with all the tracks on there and made a custom mastering effects chain that I will use throughout the whole thing. So everything sounded very seminal tonal wise. The chain went something like this. Subtractive EQ at very, very low soft frequencies and overly high ones as well. Sooth 2 for mastering goodness. Two analog emulator compressors but doing very subtle minus one to minus three max dB gain reduction at like 1.5 to one or two to one ratios, nothing heavier than that. And I did some additive EQ with some analog emulations. Again, very subtle things, no more than two dB, three at most. And I finished it with some tape emulation to round things up. Finally, the limiting was handling by two limiters, one inducing some soft clipping to round things even more and other just doing the heavy lifting. And that's it! 
that's how I made the Minecraft soundtrack in the style of American football. Alright, so I didn't really film nor write a script for an outro, so we're just gonna be talking here in my bed while I have some matecito. So, as I said, I didn't really have an outro planned for this video, so I'm just, just gonna wing it. This project has been a lot of fun, actually. Uh, producing these tracks was something I actually never thought of doing if it wasn't for for Alex who came up with the idea and just uh, pitched it to me I wouldn't I would have never like ever had thought of actually doing that actually I'm gonna close the window because this street is a bit uh, noisy today all right that's better that sounds that sounds actually more intimate now Okay, so as I was saying, uh, this project was really a thing that caught me off guard. I never thought I would be doing this and I for sure never thought it will have the reception it ended up having and it makes me so fucking happy to to see how, how many people actually enjoyed it and keep on enjoying it and just listening to it every day. I've, I've gotten like over 5,000 monthly listeners on Spotify, which is something I've never thought ever happening and it was all thanks to this little project. Also, um, the fact that I connected back to the Minecraft music, something that I I had not forgotten, but something that was like, that had been thrown into the back of my head, like of my mind and my memory. And I just didn't really remember what it was like and what it felt like. So revisiting it was something really nostalgic and it, it felt just, just felt really good to to listen to the soundtrack again and having the chance to actually reinvent it. It was, it was really good. It was something I enjoyed quite a bit. So yeah, uh, thank you so much for watching this video. I know it's been a long journey. It's like very long. <laughs> I know it took a really long time. Uh, today is March the 23rd, 24th. I don't really know. 23rd. Yeah. Yeah. It took almost a month to make this video. <laughs> it's actually funny because the actual Minecraft project took like a month and this also took almost a month to make. So yeah, thank you for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to everyone who went out of their way to donate on Bandcamp to buy the album. Thank you so much. You literally just saved my butt, like literally. Uh, it was thanks to, to the people who contributed on Bandcamp with their money um, that I was able to actually like afford doing this video because I didn't I had I had a chance to just like say okay I'm not gonna work for this week so I can make this video and it was thanks to all of that money that people were sending in for the album so thank you so much for real it, it means a lot I, I'm speechless I don't know how to thank you also I have something that I want to show you this is something that people were asking a lot uh, this bro you can see anything uh, can you see this this is a CD a Minecraft Midwest Emo CD version. And not only that, we also have cassette tapes. What? This is a cassette. This, this is a, like an actual cassette that contains the, 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 the whole album on it, like, like this. See, this is actually, this, this actually has the thing, like inside of that little magnetic tape in, in there. Isn't that so fucking cool? How, how cool is that? How, how, how fucking cool is that? So this, I have micro tapes to thank. And he reached to me and he said, hey, you wanna make some tapes and some CDs out of this? And I was like, yeah. So I'm gonna take a moment to thank him. Sergio, muchísimas gracias por la buena onda, por eh, mandar el mensaje, por acercarte a mí y por escuchar y por que te guste tanto el, el, el disco al punto de querer hacer esto. Nada, muchísimas gracias. Así que nada, mensaje para la gente de Argentina. Si sos de Argentina, podés comprarlo desde la página que está en la descripción. If you're not from Argentina, you can still get this. Check the description. You're gonna get the link for Microtapes' Instagram account and you should just go DM him and he will guide you through the process of acquiring one of these beauties. Or if you don't have a cassette player or you just don't want a cassette, you can get the CD. <laughs> which is really cool. Let me open it. I'm gonna open it for you. So as you can see, this is the, the, the I just dropped the CD. Okay, I think it's fine. I think it didn't get scratched or anything. Nah, it's totally fine. This is the CD as you can see. It says Mind West Emo. It's in Artaud <laughs> green. I love this green. It looks looks so cool. Look. 
Oh, it's not focusing. My, my phone camera is very, my phone is very old and my camera just fucking sucks. <laughs> okay, so this is the CD. I haven't had a chance to listen to it because I don't have a CD player, not a cassette player, but I, I did remastered versions for CD and cassette tapes. So I think they will sound really freaking cool. So this is the inside of the case. You have this small booklet that has uh, some things written by me. Uh, you can't read anything because this camera does not focus anything at all. Just the back side of it has the oh it reflects the, the ring light god damn it okay so you add the 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 things and all of that okay so that's pretty much that's pretty much it that's that's all i have to say about this again thank you to everyone who listened everyone who watched this video throughout the whole thing it means a lot it took a long time to make too so thank you so much i appreciate it a lot and i will be seeing you very soon i have some video ideas coming not exactly music related but it's gonna be pretty interesting for a lot of people who are producing their music so stick around i i, I encourage you to stick around thank you so much for everything for the support for the love for the love comments i think i reply to all of them i might have missed some but again i am not used to having like 30 to 40 comments a day so it's like it was a struggle for me to actually reply to all of you so thank you so much i'll be seeing you very soon so stick around <laughs> thank you so much for watching for listening and for supporting me bye bye So good.